side of the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a bit off. Just I yeah. You know, so now an upgrade variety of ACE orders is covered by a sort of app kind of scheme, which corresponds to three strings, and flows up schemes exactly correspond to ideals in those three of the strings. Um, now flows subsets correspond not to all ideals, but only to, um, to radical ideals, let's say. Um, ideals where it's some power element and the ideals of the element of the um, So somehow sub schemes represent things like, um, you know, this is kind of X. You know, why might be uh, a couple of points, but with all the So now, this is the uh, important thing. Let's say, for example, that could be half by five, then uh, over a field, then why might be something like the close up to me, I know, uh, x squared is x minus one equals zero, which uh, is like, yeah, um, as a as a set, the solutions of the equation is just say zero or one, but um, I guess there's some fatness. At the yard, from kind of multiple of these two, which is represented by a substitute because it's represented uh, that this y corresponds to the ideal in the ring, x squared. It's just one one corresponds to both substitutes and ideals. Um, and because this ideal is generated by um, this problem, it's not the same thing as the ideal generated by this x and x minus one. But even the substitute is different from this one. There's some extra that. Okay. Okay. Uh, right. So, I wanted to find uh, the fast and challenges associated with two of those elements. So, uh, let's just click on the show that it's wide as the dimensions are. And I'm looking at a close up scene of the closest variety, and that's like a picture that has several curious components. So, this means that um, I see the maximum of the dimensions of the urban components. Um, uh, of the uh, urban component team, like that's one of the two, et cetera. Um, this bracket is going to be anything. Uh, uh, elements of this cycle group are just integers minus sub right. So, yeah. They are um, where, say, S1 and SR um, are the, is, are the, uh, the dimensional, um, uh, are the n-dimensional, components of y is the most ordinary components. Um, and AI is some of the integers, um, which I have to specify. So that's the idea. And so, like in the picture, the cycle says so this close so subsidy will be it's going to be two times the origin plus one times the uh one. Uh, we want to keep track of multiplicity, so you want to connect. And in this if you're in this case, it's kind of zero that means um, here it's three less than so the idea is that um, if, uh, if, if, if y, the substance, has some sort of fatness all along uh, S1, then this coefficient for S1 is going to be bigger than y. Um, if there's some kind of non reduced structure, so fatness, uh, but only on the little subset of S1, then that's not going to contribute to this coefficient. So in other words, uh, I want to sort of 
Okay. Um, I'm going to see maybe that's okay. So let's say what? Hold back. Um, so um, we're describing the various kinds of well, the reality, what we do with more business, what how they be like.
closed subscheme is, is proper. <clears throat> okay, that's just uh, putting things together a bit. Let's see. Okay, yeah, maybe so, yeah. So one example I should mention is uh, homotopy invariance. Let's say that. locally on y, a product. Um, so like uh, u times affine space, product over k to, to u. Right, so like a, imagine a Mobius strip or something. Uh, you know, so like somehow uh, u, sorry, <laughs> x is mapping to y, and the fibers are all affine spaces. And of course, this is slightly stronger than saying that the fibers are isomorphic affine spaces. I'm saying that you can find open subsets of u that cover, sorry, open subsets of y that cover all of y, such that on those small open subsets, this, uh, the inverse image is, is just isomorphic to a product. <laughs> but the idea is, is more general than a vector bundle because I'm not saying anything about what the transition functions are. <clears throat> okay, so in this situation, I'll just state the theorem that, um, and the theorem that um, the flat pullback is an isomorphism. Chow groups of y are isomorphic to chow groups of x, I guess, in this case, uh, the relative dimension is, is n, my numbering, so this is chow sub i plus n of x. <clears throat> and this is called, um, or you know, a version of what could be called homotopy invariance for chow groups. Um, sort of thinking of, um, you know, the affine line as, as a kind of analog of the unit interval. <clears throat> or the real line, I guess. Various possible analogies. Okay, um, right, so I said just to, uh, get used to <laughs> translating between the dimension and co-dimension notation. Um, if, if y is smooth, then also x is smooth, um, and then I can use co-dimension notation, which looks a little bit neater in this formula. Um, so if y is smooth over k, then we just translate this in terms of co-dimension notation, and it looks a little nicer, and that says that just chow upper j of y is isomorphic to the chow, chow group, you know, in the same co-dimension for, for x. Right. I mean, hopefully it's obvious why that happens, right? If you have a subvariety of, of y of a certain codimension, then its inverse image has the same codimension in, in x. Okay, let's see, right? Yeah, and, and, and no. Oh, and I could have said that, you know, in the context of smooth varieties, this, this pullback is a ring homomorphism, and so, you know, this is an isomorphism of, of rings, uh, chow rings for smooth varieties. <clears throat> okay. Maybe a good thing to say quickly is, um, let's see, yeah, I should discuss uh, the first churn class. I sort of mentioned that there are churn classes um, for vector bundles, but let me try to say something quickly about the, the first churn class in particular. Um, so just because this is sort of such, such a fundamental um, geometric idea. Um, so let's say given an algebraic uh, line bundle, um, L on a scheme X, um, uh, how to define, um, yeah, let, let me just, these a little bit more specific and say a variety um, of dimension, I mean, could, one could define this more generally, but anyway, uh, define this on a variety of dimension N. Um, so what is the first term class of L, which should be in um, the child group of dimension N minus one of X. Um, so I mentioned that, yeah. So, so for example, if, if x is smooth, which is maybe a reasonable case to think about, then the first turn class lives in chow upper one, um, yeah, which is sort of the numbering you would expect. Um, okay, so this has a simple definition, um, which, which hopefully agrees with your topological intuition. So this is a, you know, this is, this is a top turn class, um, and so in topology, the top turn class of a complex vector bundle could also be called the Euler class. This is the class that, um, it's the first obstruction to whether this line bundle has a nowhere vanishing section. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, so how do you do that? Well, you look at any section and then you look at where it's zero, okay? Now, in algebraic geometry, you have this difficulty that um, not every line bundle has a global section other than zero, um, but you always have a rational section. That is a section, so to speak, that has some, possibly some zeros and some poles, okay? So let S be a rational section um, of L on X, uh, sorry, which is not identically zero, um, and to sort of formally define that, you could just say, what I mean is uh, take an actual section of this line bundle on some non-empty open subset of X um, that's not identically zero. So, i.e., S is an actual, uh, so, so in algebraic geometry language, you'd say S is uh, in H0 of U come L for some, that this is the space of sections of L on an open subset U um, for an open U inside X that's not empty. So, so to speak, this is, a, this is I hope it's clear. Um, this represents um, a, you know, a section that's sort of, a, so on a certain open set U, this is a sort of genuine section, zero some places, not zero other places, but then outside U, you might imagine this section is kind of like going to infinity. So to speak, outside U, it might have, have some poles. <clears throat> okay, so then we just define the first term class of this line bundle is, well, I, in this notation, it's, it's uh, the, the uh, divisor associated to the section um, S. So that's a, a sum of co-dimension one subvarieties with some integer uh, coefficients. Integers because, you know, the, the coefficients, I mean, so the, the zero set of this section would be like one times this point plus one times this point plus maybe minus one times the point where there's a pole. Um, and, you know, and, and there's multiplicities, like if you could have a section of, that vanishes to order two and then the zero, the, the zero set of that would be two times this point in the picture. Um, so let's see. So I mean, I didn't really define this notation, but the idea is that I defined the divisor associated to a rational function, and um, the divisor associated to a rational section of a line bundle, sort of locally, is kind of exactly the same thing, because like near any given point in X, um, I can choose the trivialization of this line bundle, and then a rational section, in terms of that trivialization, a rational section is just a rational function. And so I can measure you know, how much, what's the order of the zero or pole of that function at a given co-dimension one subvariety. Now, so, so this maps to the Chow groups, and um, if you're <laughs> awake, you might think, okay, this looks like this should be zero because the definition of Chow groups is that divisors of rational functions are defined to be zero. Um, but you know, this is a subtle point. This is not necessarily zero because, um, uh, because a line bundle has local trivializations but not um, global trivializations. So globally, this um, divisor is just some sum of subvarieties with integer coefficients is not necessarily globally the, the divisor of a rational function, even though sort of locally it is. But okay, that's, that's what happens. Okay. <clears throat> but of course, you know, if L was the trivial line bundle, then this would be zero in child groups, as you would expect. Yeah, and I just, let me briefly say that sort of, <laughs> this has like all the properties of child groups, I'm sorry, of churn classes you would expect, like behavior under tensor products and so on. Um, so let's say this is a group homomorphism from the child groups, sorry, from the group of isomorphism classes of line bundles. Is that okay? <laughs> the group of isomorphism classes of line bundles on X where the group operation is tensor product to the uh, co-dimension one child group, which I could also call the divisor class group. Um, just different names for the same thing. Uh, so, right, so this is a group of co-dimension one subvarieties modulo, you know, you count the divisor of every rational function as being zero. That's that's specific case of child groups is called the divisor class group. Um, yeah, so I was saying that the group homomorphism, i.e., just to spell that out, the first chain class of a tensor product of line bundles is the sum, uh, you know, as in topology. Um, and finally, I want to say that this is, C1 is an isomorphism uh, if X is smooth. Okay. okay, and just to maybe say very briefly why that is, I mean, it's because uh, in the case of smooth varieties, you can go back from divisors to um, line bundles by the standard construction, uh, so given, so <laughs> proof in quotation marks, uh, given a divisor D on X, which just means a co-dimension one algebraic cycle, a sum of 
codimension one subvarieties with integer coefficients. Um, the corresponding line bundle, you can just define it by hand, like a, an inverse to this map, um, is, uh, so in sheaf theory language, I define a line bundle by saying what its sections are on any open set. Um, for u inside x open, um, the sections of, of the line bundle corresponding to d to this divisor on an open set are the set of um, rational functions on x such that, um, let's see, <laughs> the divisor of f plus d. So um, this is some divisor on x. I want that divisor restricted to u to have non-negative coefficients. You know, so, so like if d is 0, this would be the set of rational functions um, that you know, have only zeros, not poles. Um, so that would be just a set of regular functions, which is the sections of the trivial line bundle. In general, this is saying we're talking about rational functions with some, at most, a certain pole as specified by the divisor. <coughs> and then it's the fact that um, the first term class of this line bundle is, um, is the class of D in child groups. Oh, yeah, and I could say that why did I need x smooth? The point is you could define this if x is singular, um, but, but then this would be a sheaf, not necessarily a line bundle. So something has to be proved that if x is smooth, because the local rings are unique factorization domains, this is a line bundle. OK. Let's see. Yeah. OK, okay so maybe to give like sort of computation that, you, that goes with that, um, I can describe the child groups of um, a, a GM bundle over some variety. So, um, so if, uh, so let's say that L is a uh, line bundle, um, maybe, yeah, let me just say over a smooth variety. Um, I don't know how much generality I'm going to need. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so algebraic geometers like to define line bundles as a certain kind of sheaf. Um, but, I mean, uh, you could also sort of view a line bundle geometrically uh, as, as a variety, an actual variety, with uh, a map, you know, 2, 2x. Two um, so uh, how do I want to write this? So I'll just write um, just L for, the, um, for this scheme associated to this line bundle. So it's an actual scheme um, with a morphism to x where the fibers are affine lines. Um, yeah. OK, sort of. So the, and this is uh, with fibers uh, A1. This is a, an affine space bundle like I described over there. Um, OK, so in this situation, well, we know what the child groups of, of this scheme are, because that's an affine space bundle over uh, x. Um, so the child ring of L is just isomorphic to the child ring of x. So to speak, homotopy invariance tells you that. But um, an interesting question that sometimes comes up is, what if I remove the uh, zero section? Um, so the zero section is isomorphic to x, um, and let me see. So I, um, I want to now add the fact that the Chow ring of L minus the zero section, so it, I hope it's clear, right? This is a subright, the zero section is a subright, it's isomorphic to, to x, right? Where these, you know, the zero point in each of these fibers, um, that is um, isomorphic to the Chow ring of x module of the first term class of, of uh, L. You just sort of set this one class, the first term class of line bundle, to um, zero. So yeah, without writing down too much, um, why is this? So you could, you could analyze this using the localization sequence. This is an open subset of something whose child groups you know. So basically, yeah, what does that say? That, that tells you that this has to be some, some quotient of the child ring of x. And what are you mining out by? You're mining out by the classes of all subvarieties contained in the zero section. Um, and so the calculation that has to be done is um, if I take a cycle on x, push it forward to this uh, line bundle, and then pull it back, I haven't exactly discussed that pullback, um, that uh, pushing forward and then pulling back is multiplication by this first term class. Um, so somehow, yeah, so, yeah, how do I want to see this? Like, sort of geometrically, why is that happening? So the first term class represents sections of this line bundle, if there are any sections. Let's imagine that this line bundle actually has a section that's not identically zero as opposed to a rational section. So then the idea is that th the class of this subvariety x is rationally equivalent to the class of this um, section up here. And then, if, yeah, just, sorry, geometrically, I hope it's clear that if you try to pull that section back to the zero section, you'll get the zero set of that um, section. And that's what represents this for sure class. Sorry, so that's too fast, but maybe it's uh, useful for somebody. 
Okay. Let's see. Okay, and maybe like one last calculation I'll just sort of state is the child groups of a the projective bundle formula, I guess. Um, basic thing in any kind of cohomology theory. Um, so it's a theorem for a vector bundle E over, I mean, I'm just sort of being lazy by stating things for smooth schemes. Um, X over K. Um, so let's say let P of E be the associated um, projective bundle. So like this is a vector bundle um, E of rank N. Um, P of E is the associated um, Pn minus 1 bundle uh, over X. And uh, different authors, unfortunately, disagree on how, what this means. But you know, let's say we define this following Fulton to be the space of, um, of one-dimensional linear subspaces of E. Um, so in other words, I need some operation that goes from, from an n-dimensional vector space to an n minus one-dimensional projective space. One way to do it is to take, take the space of lines in there. Um, right? So yeah, you have x, you have e where the fibers are um, vector spaces. And then associated to that, I have this other thing, sort of lower dimensional. Um, this is associated where here, I'm sorry, it's not visible, but the fibers of this map are Pn minus 1 instead of being uh, n-dimensional vector spaces. Um, OK, so then it is a fact that um, what can we do? So OK, so on this um, projective bundle, there's an obvious line bundle, um, sort of by construction. So at any given point in this. Um, projective bundle, there is, that sort of represents, a one-dimensional linear subspace in one of these fibers over here. Like this is a point, this is a fiber. A point in P of E represents a line in one of these fibers. And so you can make a vector bundle on P of E whose fiber is that line. Um, that line is up to algebraic geometry, it's called O minus 1. Um, so we have an obvious line bundle, O minus 1. Uh, it's contained in the pullback of E, where I guess pi is this morphism. Um, so yeah, so at every point of x, you have this vector space E. You could pull that back and think of that as a vector space associated to a point on P of E. And at a given point in P of E, you have a given one-dimensional subspace of that. That's, oh, thank you, yeah. OK. Um, OK, so then the theorem says that um, the Chow ring of this projective bundle is the free module over the Chow ring of x um, uh, with generators 1, u, up to u to the n minus 1, where um, u I define to be the first term class of this, say, O of minus 1. OK. Uh, yeah, or you could write this in terms of O of 1. Uh, anyway, there's lots of different ways to write this formula. But OK. Um, right, so, so I hope the notation is clear. This says it's a free module um, with, uh, with you know, n generators. So for example, right, this, there's the case where x is just a point, then this is just projective space, and so this is writing out then the Chow ring of projective space. It's a sort of truncated polynomial ring. Um, oh yeah, where I should say. So this is in Chow upper 1. Um, and so you know, these powers are living in higher uh, degrees, higher co-dimensions. Oh yeah, OK. And so <laughs> one thing about this is, well, um, in this situation, x is, is smooth, so I can it's, these things are rings, and so you might ask, okay, so what is u to the n in this, uh, t in this uh, ring? You know, it's got to be, u to the n must be somewhere in there, in this ring, but what is it? Well, the answer is, it's got to be some linear combination of 1 u up to u to the n minus 1, and the coefficients uh, of that expression are exactly the term classes uh, of E. So this is a way, this is Grodenik's way of defining um, the term classes of a vector bundle. Um, you have not write down the exact formula, but... You can work it out from this exact sequence uh, what the relation between. Yeah, I, I think I will just not try to say more. But that is a way to define churn classes of a vector model. <clears throat> of course, that works very nicely in topology, too, that definition. Let's see. Uh, yeah. OK. Thank you. OK. Um, so, okay, so I think I'm on to child groups of classifying spaces now. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so gel uh, groups of classifying spaces, and we may get to equivariant gel groups a bit more generally. Um, okay, so yeah, two, so let's say, the, the setup that I was discussing is I wanted to find, um, yeah, given uh, an affine group scheme, uh, G, um, a finite type over a field, um, okay. Uh, okay, so, yeah. Uh, and I gave examples. Uh, finite groups can be viewed as affine group schemes. So, uh, so can, um, you know, GLN, standard matrix groups. Um, okay, what to do? Uh, so, so, yeah, first, uh, first fact, uh, which I'm going to use for definition, is that G is known that G has um, a finite dimensional faithful representation. Um, okay. Okay. And say uh, V. Um, and uh, yeah, I think a fact which I don't want to bother checking, but it is easy is that um, uh, so if you look at G X, G, if you look at the direct sum of many copies of V, then G will act freely on that um, outside a, a subset of, of sort of larger and larger co dimension. Um, so freely, so then just given that that's a representation, saying that the representation is faithful means that the kernel, so representation corresponds to homomorphism from G to GLV, and faithful means that the kernel of that homomorphism is trivial. <coughs> okay, if that's the case, then G lacks freely on um, a big direct sum of copies of uh, V minus some closed algebraic subset um, with co-dimension of S inside V uh, going to infinity as this number capital N goes to infinity. Okay, so, um, so I don't need this, I don't need to, this is a particular sequence of representations um, such that G acts sort of more and more freely on them. There's nothing really special about this sequence of representations. I could use any sequence of representations um, that has that same property. Okay, so. Um, all right. Yeah, and this is sort of just a, a kind of easy dimension uh, counting argument like, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. 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 So, um, okay, so then from that, I can make the following definition. Um, so for a given, so G is given, and for a given um, number I greater than equal to zero, define um, the i co-dimension I child group of the classifying space of this group to be um, the i child group of a certain quotient variety, um, W minus S mod G, where um, for any representation, uh, finite dimensional representation W of G such that, um, well, I want G to act freely on this open subset, um, let's say, for any representation and any um, G invariant closed subset. Um, so G invariant just means a subset that G maps into itself. Um, yeah, but definitely um, we are sort of in the world of algebraic geometry here. So this is not just a linear subspace in this vector space. You know, it's a, a, a subset defined by some, some polynomial equations being uh, zero, <coughs> uh, such that, so I need that G acts freely on the open complement of this subset. And I just need that the codimension of uh, S inside W should be greater than I. Okay, so that's, that's a definition. A bit of a mouthful, but okay, that's a definition. So <clears throat> to define a given uh, particular, like the ith child group of BG, um, it's, got, it's equal to the ith child group of a certain, a co-dimension ith child group of a certain, you know, finite dimensional algebraic variety. So what that means is that to come out to describe all these groups for all i, you have to look at higher and higher dimensional representations, right, in order to make this could have mentioned bigger and bigger, but for a given group, if you want to define that, it's just a child group of a certain finite dimensional um, variety. <clears throat> yeah, and I might say this is a very nice variety. Um, so, you know, this is an open subset of a vector space, so that's smooth. G is acting freely in that situation, so this quotient is also a smooth uh, algebraic variety. <clears throat> I'm being <laughs> sort of slightly sloppy. There is, um, 
an issue of making sure that, uh, being, that you can construct um, quotient schemes as opposed to more general things like algebraic spaces. Um, but let's say it is a fact that, that you can always um, choose S and then W in such a way that this quotient is actually a scheme, so I won't worry about that issue. Okay. Uh, right, and so the, the question is, um, why is this definition well-defined? Um, so, you know, defining this group on the left, uh, and here I have to choose W, and strictly speaking, I also have to choose uh, S, um, you know, why is this independent of choices? And somehow it's, it's independent up to like a canonical isomorphism. So why? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so let's go over here. Okay. So let's say, uh, yeah, so proof that this is well-defined. Um, okay. So I just have to look at like two different representations and two different closed subsets and try to identify these, um, these corresponding child groups. Okay, so, um, so G is fixed, I is fixed, and now let um, W1 come S1 and W2 come S2 be two different um, uh, pairs as above. Um, so W1 and W2 are both finite dimensional representations of G. Um, you have these two closed subsets, and I have these assumptions. G is, in both cases, G is acting freely on the open complement, uh, and in both cases, the co-dimension of the subset is, is bigger than this, this given number I. <clears throat> okay, uh, so then I want to show that this group for the two subsets can be um, identified. Okay, so what do you do? The idea is to, um, is to sort of compare both these representations to the direct sum representation. Um, fairly natural thing to do. Um, compare both W1 and W2 to the direct sum. Okay, um, so what happens? Well, you have a map. Um, what could I do? I could look at uh, W1 direct sum W2. That's you know, some other vector space. Um, that obviously maps to W1, and this is a geocovariant map. I mean, so obviously I have, um, right, obviously I have these morphisms of algebraic varieties, just projections of vector spaces, and G is acting on everything in the diagram. The maps are compatible with that. <coughs> okay, um, now, okay, so I also have these subsets S to deal with right over here. Yeah, so one thing I could do would be just to look at, um, I have this open subset, W1 minus S1, I could just look at the inverse image of that in, um, in the direct sum up there. Okay, so if I have, let's say, W1 minus S1, then the inverse image of that is, I guess, obviously, I could write it as a product variety. It's W1 minus S1 times W2. Okay, and um, yeah, so here, now G is acting on, on both these varieties, but it's acting freely on both of them. So I can talk about, um, I can look at the, quotient variety, right? So, you know, hopefully, right, it's clear that, you know, because G acts freely on this part, G acts freely on this product variety, sort of no matter how it's acting on W2, right? G, G always fixes the origin in a representation, but, so, you know, but nonetheless in this product, the action is free. Okay, and so this, uh, this map has the property that the pullback on child groups is an isomorphism, right? Because this is a vector one. Um, so there's a certain subtlety here, which is that this is, um, so sort of, if you think about it, the, the fibers of this map are sort of obviously, every individual fiber is isomorphic to W2. Um, but if you think about it, it's not totally obvious that, that um, that's a vector bundle in the algebraic geometry sense, meaning that it's locally trivial on, you know, Zariski open subsets here. Um, so, so technically, this uses the fact that um, vector bundles in algebraic geometry, <laughs> like in the Itala topology, are the same thing as vector bundles in the Zariski topology, which is um, you know, a technical thing that has to be checked in algebraic geometry. It's called, uh, in one language, Hilbert's theorem 90, or in fancier language, it's called uh, growth index theory of facially flat descent. But in any case, uh, it says that you know, any way you define vector bundles in algebraic geometry, you get the same notion. Um, right, and yeah, so. It's, 
So, so anyway, so this is a vector bundle, and so um, the Chow ring of this first quotient variety, you know, is the same thing uh, as the Chow, in particular Chow i. I'm interested in this particular Chow group, uh, Chow upper i. That's the same thing as for uh, the quotient upstairs. Uh, times w2 divided by g. Okay. Uh, right, and of course I could do the same thing for w2, right? So the Chow, this given co-dimension i Chow group for w2 minus s2 my g, that is the same thing as the corresponding Chow group for now w1 times w2 minus s2, all that divided by g. Right, by the same argument. Uh, this thing is a vector bundle over this thing. Okay, and so now I have these two open sets to compare, um, but this is sort of not too bad because you know, these, are, these are both like, open, these, before I divide by g, these are both open subsets of the same g variety, w1 times w2. Okay, and so, you know, what I can do is just compare both these open subsets to their intersection. A fairly obvious thing to do. Um, I couldn't really com directly compare them to, to w1 times w2 because g is not acting freely on that um, product. But, yeah, but if I look at smaller open subsets, then, of course, g is still acting freely. Um, let's see. There has not really been a picture. Okay, forgive me. Um, so let's see. But then, um, then I claim that um, chow i of this first quotient, so w1 minus s1 times w2 divided by g, I want to argue that that's isomorphic to chow upper i of um, what would it be? w1 minus s1 times w2 minus s2, that's the intersection of the two open sets divided by g. And then in turn, that should be isomorphic to the other child group on the right, which will finish the proof. Uh, w1 times w2 minus s uh, divided by g. OK, right, so if I can prove these two isomorphisms, that will prove that, you know, that these two things on the left are isomorphic. OK, but you know, this is now quite easy because um, the point is that what are we doing in going from like this thing to this thing? We're just like going from one open set to a smaller open set. And um, the point is that we have this assumption that these subsets that we're removing have co-dimension greater than i. So I think if I have <laughs> the numbering right, that should mean that what I'm removing and going from this set to this set is also something of co-dimension greater than i. So you know, here we're removing a closed subset. Um, of co-dimension greater than i. Well, maybe at first sight, we're moving, if you think about it, before you divide by g, it's kind of easy to count that to go from this open set to that open set, you're removing a set of co-dimension greater than i. But then also, because g is acting freely, that doesn't change the, the co-dimensions. And so going from there to there, we're removing a closed subset of co-dimension greater than i. And in that situation, then the localization sequence on Chow groups implies that Chow upper i just stays the same. And so we're done. Um, so how, let's write this, like chow upper i, uh, I don't know what to write, this. anyway, like of some, you know, some big open set, like this thing, maybe, this thing, I don't know, t, uh, t maps to chow upper i of t minus some closed uh, set s, um, you know, what would come before here, so in my examples, uh, s is smooth, but this closed subset that I'm remo removing might not be smooth, so I have to use um, you know, homological notation for, um, for S, which might be singular. But anyway, I have this exact sequence, and the point is that here, um, the dimension, you know, because S is co-dimension greater than I, the dimension of S is less than N minus I, so N is, of course, the dimension of T here. Um, yeah, so, so, so this, this group is just obviously zero, right? If you have a um, closed set of dimension less than N minus I, this child group is just obviously zero, and so um, this map, this restriction map is an isomorphism, and that says that this map from that child group to that child group is an isomorphism. <laughs> okay, and of course the same argument applies over here. We're, we're changing an open set by removing something of high codimension greater than i, and so this codimension i child group doesn't change. Okay, <laughs> QED. So let me see where I am. Uh, okay. Uh, you may should say any questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, please try and interrupt if you want. Okay. Okay. Mm. 
So what to do? So maybe let's give uh, some quick uh, calculations of that. So for example, um, like what is the Chow ring of the classifying space? Oh yeah, yeah, so I didn't really, yeah, there may be some comment to make is, okay, so this, I sort of gave an isomorphism between these two, um, you know, definitions of the Chow group. You know, let's just say you can check that that is, that isomorphism doesn't depend on any choices. Um, and also, uh, let's say this. Um, also, that makes the Chow ring into a ring. Um, is a commutative graded ring. Um, again, well, let me just say this. So, so to define like the product from Chow upper A times Chow upper B to Chow upper A plus B, um, you can just define that product on some finite dimensional approximation to BG. I mean, I hope it's clear. Yeah, so, so what we're doing in this argument is defining the child group of BG to be equal to the child group of a certain, so to speak, finite dimensional approximation to BG. And on there, those are smooth varieties that we're using, and there you have products. Then you just have to check that the products you define using one approximation are the same as the products using any other, but that's kind of easy. They have the same kind of argument. <clears throat> okay, so for example, um, what is the child ring of the classifying space of the multiplicative group? Um, so <laughs> let's say, so over C, people sometimes write um, you know, GM as C star, um, but some uh, algebraic geometry <laughs> convention is, is to write things in a way that doesn't explicitly mention the base field, because a lot of things work the same way no matter what the base field is. So in general, you know, GM, means the affine line over whatever field we have minus the R, with the group operation being multiplication. <coughs> um, right, so what is that? Uh, so what do you do? So yeah, so in this case, everything is quite easy. Uh, to think about, I, to make these finite dimensional approximations, I just start with some faithful representation of GM, and there's an obvious one dimensional, um, you know, uh, the obvious one dimensional faithful representation of this group. Um, so, so, you know, GM just is isomorphic to the group of one by one matrices, and that is a faithful representation. In fact, it's an isomorphism. Um, so, yeah, uh, then GM acts, in this case, freely on um, L direct sum capital N minus the origin. So in general, you know, you might have to remove a bit more than the origin to get the group to act freely, but in this case, the action is free. I mean, hopefully this is obvious. This is the action T of X1 through x capital N equal to T x1 blah 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 T x n. So as long as at least one of the xi's is not zero, this action is free. <coughs> okay. So you know, hopefully it's clear where this is going. Uh, so then, you know, so like chow i of the classifying space of the multiplicative group is the same thing as chow i of um, I just need to arrange, you know, choose a representation such that this action is free um, in codimension greater than i, so I could take this capital N to be i plus one. Um, so I'm basically taking yeah, L to the n plus one minus the origin divided by GM, but you know, this is the standard action that defines projective space. You take affine space minus the origin divided by this group action, that is projective space. So this is chow upper i of Pn, uh, or I guess, well, I don't know. This is for any capital N, at least I. I could do this, um, yeah. And so as long as N is at least I, this group is isomorphic to the integers. Um, you know, and you know, somehow, it's, it's e because we know what the Chow ring of projective spaces, it's easy to read off what the Chow ring structure here is. So basically, the, the, the ring structure in these groups is the same thing, by definition, as the Chow ring, as the ring structure here, like up to degree N. You, know, you can't sort of see this whole ring in infinitely many dimensions on one of these approximations, but up to degree n, it is the same thing as Pn, and so we read off that this Chow ring uh, is the polynomial ring on one generator. Um, so degree of u equals one, I use this notation for meaning um, that u is an element of Chow upper one, keeping track of the codimension. <coughs> okay. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, if <laughs> it's a graded ring, there's no difference. I mean. It, I hope <laughs> you see in what sense there is no difference. It, it's a graded ring. Okay. Right. I mean, I agree, etymologists might like to call it a power series ring. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, OK, so there's that. Oh, yeah, and sort of um, maybe let's just say things sort of quickly. Let me just to maybe like state a calculation. Um, so, oh, yeah, so I don't want to say this. Well, OK, let me just state a calculation and then sort of discuss what it means. Another sort of basic calculation is that the Chow ring of the classifying space of the general linear group over any field um, is the polynomial ring on generators, <laughs> well, one generator in degree one, two, up to n. Um, but somehow the natural name for those generators is the churn classes um, with uh, degree of ci equal to i. Um, um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, OK, <laughs> various things to say, like, why do I call these things churn classes? Um, OK, so that's because um, there's sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> different ways of explaining why Turing classes are a good name for these things. So one, one explanation would be just to compare this with what happens in topology. Um, so mm, let's say if my base field is the complex numbers, um, then I have a natural like cycle map um, from the Chow ring of any classifying space to the integral cohomology of um, the associated um, classifying space in topology. You know where. If, if G is an algebraic group over the complex numbers, this is my notation for <laughs> the actual group uh, of, uh, you know, complex points of G um, with the classical topology. Um, right. So why do you have this? I mean, and basically I want to say that this is obvious because, um, so this Chow ring is defined as the Chow groups of, uh, up to a certain degree of one of these finite dimensional approximations. And those approximations are, in topology, something which is approximately contractible up to a certain degree divided by G. So, that's how you define the classifying space in topology. Um, yeah, so we have this cycle map, and yeah, so I guess one way to describe this calculation for k of the complex numbers is that for, uh, for g equal to gm or gln over c, um, this cycle map is an isomorphism. Um, and maybe, yeah, let me just comment that in case you're not familiar with working with groups, um, non-compact groups like GLNC, well, GLN, any uh, non-compact Lie group like GLNC, it is homotopy equivalent to, to any maximal compact uh, subgroup of it. In this case, that's the unitary group. And, um, and, and so maybe you're familiar with this, you know, in saying that the, the ordinary cohomology of BUN is this uh, polynomial ring. It's, it's the same thing. Uh, right, so, so in that sense, right. well, because these elements in cohomology are called Chow groups, the, the elements here, the map to them, it, well, it's reasonable, sorry, to call them um, churn classes as well. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, but there's other, <laughs> other ways of explaining why that, that's a good name for these elements, um, which is that, uh, so just like in, in topology, why, why are we interested in classifying spaces? One reason is that elements of this, uh, you know, ring are characteristic classes. They, are, in, they give you invariance for principal G bundles, and the same thing is true in algebraic geometry. <laughs> So let's say, remark that sort of um, the Chow ring of BG, I mean, there's something here that has to be proved, but um, it is true that this Chow ring is the ring, like for any group over any field, um, uh, it's the ring of characteristic classes for G bundles in algebraic geometry, um, let's say over smooth K schemes um, that take values uh, in, in the uh, Chow ring. Um, so, chowering of whatever smooth varieties we're considering. Um, okay, so this takes uh, a few uh, words to, to clarify. So, so one is, okay, what do I mean by G bundles? Um, I mean G bundles in the most general sense. So um, these are G bundles that are um, locally trivial. In, in the weakest possible sense. Um, so in the flat topology, you could say. Um, so this is a sort of very weak notion of what it means for a bundle to be locally trivial. So this implies that these bundles um, are locally trivial. Um, oops, sorry, I guess, <laughs> right. So yeah, what I wanna say. So, so yeah, these are G bundles in the most general sense. So um, what can I say? So, so if G is smooth over K, then this is the same as being, um, uh, this is equivalent to G bundles that are locally trivial in the Atal, in the Atal topology. Um, 
mm. which you might be more familiar with. In other words, these are, um, for smooth groups, we're talking about bundles that become trivial, not necessarily on Zariski open subsets of X, but on some finite covering spaces of those. Um, And finally, for some, for a few special groups, um, uh, this is the same as G bundles, um, such as, let me just, a few examples are uh, GM and GLN. This is the same as um, being locally trivial in the Zariski topology, maybe the more naive sense. Um, so this is equivalent to being um, locally trivial in the uh, Zariski topology. So this is the fact that I mentioned that for vector bundles, um, there's kind of only one notion of vector bundles. Uh, if, if you define a vector bundle in a very general sense, it turns out that it is automatically Zariski locally trivial. But that wouldn't be true for groups in general. For groups in general, um, what's relevant here are G bundles in the most general sense, and the idea is that that's the most interesting sense, I would argue. <coughs> um, right, yeah? Uh, time is it? Yeah, thank you, okay. Uh, okay, so. Stop there, and what's to say? Um, okay, I just want to say quickly, like, sorry, so what is a characteristic class? You know, it's an assignment whenever you have a principal, sorry, sorry about this, but every time you have a principal G bundle over some variety, that is a variety with a free G action whose quotient is X, then um, an element in the Chow ring, uh, whatever, like A and Chow I of BG, together with a principal G bundle, gives you an element um, in the Chow groups of, of X. And those elements are compatible with pullback. Um, that's the definition of characteristic class. Okay, thank you. What's